Apollos. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19.10. Welcome to Debate Night on Praise I Am Apologetics channel, everyone. Good to see everyone. This should be a great discussion. This has been a long time in the making with Mark Reed from Australia and Gavin Hurlman from New Zealand. And uh, so looking forward to this one. And uh, before we before we kick her off, I'm going to do a brief introduction and maybe hear from our speakers, where they're from, what they're trying to accomplish. And uh, so we'll start with Gavin first. So Gavin, um, you, you just probably skip the intro. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a channel. So, uh, what, yeah. so maybe what you're trying to accomplish, like maybe apologetics or are you trying to, you know, bring sinners to repentance and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm stuck, stuck way down here at the bottom of the earth, a bit like Mark. We're hanging on for dear life if we believe in a flat earth. But um, I don't have a channel. I haven't got much, actually. Um, <laughs> but I do these debates trying to um, make sense, make sense of the Bible and make sense of God's presence in our lives and, uh, and the reason why we, why we have this life that we have. So that'll be enough. Oh, I just need to ask you, Praise, is, are my references in the video description? They are indeed, and I appreciate your intro there. But Mark, you're next if you want to give a brief introduction about yourself. Yeah, uh, my name's Mark Reed. Um, I'm uh, like, as Gavin said, if you're on Flat Earth, we're hanging on the edge of the Earth or whatever. Um, yeah, so this is the rumble from Down Under, so excuse the accents, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm basically just <laughs> an uh, atheist from, from Australia. I mean, depending on your definition of atheist, you could call me an agnostic if you want to stretch the classical definitions. But I'm really not interested in the label. I, I'm really, um, I was uh, grown up in a very secular family, so I, I find um, belief system structures and epistemology very, very fascinating. So um, I like to know why people believe in what they believe. And um, as of yet, I haven't seen any uh, good evidence for God, and I'm hoping that uh, Gavin can, can bust out the solid, reliable, robust, uh, rigorous evidence that will show that uh, God exists. Um, so yeah, that's basically uh, um, um, you know everything about me that you need to know. Um, I don't have a channel. I'm not doing this professionally. I just uh, yeah, just would like to uh, have a chat about um, you know esoteric matters and things like that. Gotcha. Thank you, uh, Mark. And yeah, looking forward to you and Gavin's uh, dialogue tonight. Should be a good one. And we're going to go into the debate format. We have 10 to 15 minute openings each, 10 minute cross examine or rebuts, and then a 30 minute open discussion and a five minute closing. And then we'll have audience Q and A. So if you guys want to tag me, make sure you put you know add praise I am that I am or praise I am. I think it's praise I am. Yeah. So I'll try to do. We'll try to do that tonight. And um, so I, I believe that we agree that Gavin's going to start us off tonight. And so Gavin, I'll start the timer when you give me the the green arrow or the green light. I mean, sorry, yeah. green arrow. Praise, yeah, praise. Would you mind giving me a five minute? And a 10 minute warning, please. Yeah, hold on real quick. Gotcha. Yep. Um, so, whenever you're ready, Gavin, we'll, uh, I'll start the timer and we'll get going. Okay, great. So, I just want to thank Mark um, for agreeing to the debate. It's your classic uh, theist versus atheist debate about the existence of God. Um, not the easiest of debates to have. But uh, I like Mark already because his accent is more like mine than like an Australian. So I'm going to start and I will go now. So God acts in more than one way in the natural world. God sustains the regular patterns of the physical world, but sometimes he chooses to act outside of those patterns. God's regular patterns are what scientists describe as natural laws or processes like gravity or photosynthesis, for example. God's actions outside those patterns are generally and usually called miracles, um, like raising someone from the dead. That would be called a miracle. Christians believe in the miracles in the Bible and that God can do miracles and does do miracles today. 
We also believe that God is just as involved in the regular patterns of the created order as he is in miracles. So what is a miracle? In the Bible, events variously described as miracles, signs and wonders are performed by the prophets, the apostles and by Jesus Christ in an answer to the prayers of God's people. Biblical miracles didn't merely occur for the amazement or the entertainment of onlookers, but they occurred to serve God's kingdom purposes. And they always occurred within a theological context. Now, that word context is important because if you take a text, a text out of context, you're going to end up being conned. It's a good thing to remember. Some non-believers, some non-believers in God, they view science itself as rescuing society from irrational ideas and harmful superstitions like miracles. They believe miracles are violations of natural law and are by definition absolutely impossible. This is an idea that can be traced back to the Scottish philosopher David Hume in the 1700s. So, nature is what God does. Nature is not what God is. Nature is what God does. Miracles happen against the backdrop of regular day-to-day -day functioning of natural phenomena. The Bible describes God acting directly and routinely in the natural world. An example is Psalm 114, uh, where it says, He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. The first part of the verse refers to God's direct action, while the second part suggests that water flows through its own natural properties. Throughout the psalm, the point of view changes fluidly um, <clears throat> back and forth between what we might call the laws of nature and the direct action of God. Such dual descriptions can be found throughout the Old Testament, and the New Testament continues this pattern and makes explicit that all of creation is actively sustained by God through Jesus Christ. An example being Hebrews 1.3 where it says the Son, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Also in Colossians uh, 1.17, Paul writes the following, he is before all things and in him all things are held together. In other words, if God were to stop sustaining all things by his powerful word, the world would stop existing. In fact, we wouldn't even be a puddle on the floor. When describing nature, then, the Bible easily switches perspectives depending on whether it's emphasizing the regular behavior of natural phenomena or God's providential sustenance. Uh, the biblical authors don't really make a distinction between natural and supernatural events. Uh, because these are kind of modern categories. But as Christian thinkers throughout the Middle Ages wrestled with the questions of miracles and God's action in the world, the following ideas emerged. If the regularities of nature are a manifestation of the sustenance of God, then one would expect them to be trustworthy and consistent rather than arbitrary or capricious. The regular behavior of nature could be viewed as the customs of the creator. Scientists, even, even um, secular scientists, inadvertently glorify God by studying these laws of nature. A strong case can be made that such theological realizations help pave the way for the rise of modern science. In addition to God working through regular patterns, the Bible also describes miracles that defy description in terms of current 21st century science. At the heart of the Christian belief is the stunning miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I'll talk more about that shortly. Um, now, here's the thing. The more we know, the more we know about the processes of death and decay, um, the less likely it appears that Jesus could have risen from the dead by any natural means whatsoever. Rather, science strengthens the case that if Jesus did indeed rise from the dead, the event must have occurred without, above, or against God's ordinary providential working. Against God's ordinary providential working. And as the Cambridge evolutionary biologist Simon Conway Morris notes, he says, 
Uh, quote, I'm not surprised at those New Testament miracles reported. I am surprised that they are so few. What else would you expect when the Creator visits his creation? Christians emphasize that God has created throughout natural history using regular patterns that can be described scientifically. Now, this is because we, we, we are, uh, this is not because we're opposed in principle to the concept of miracles, but because science, science, thank goodness, has proved extraordinarily capable of filling in the gaps in our knowledge. Because scientific explanations do not replace God, but instead describe his regular, regular activity, um, there's no danger of explaining, explaining away God. Also, Christians generally agree that the context of natural history is not fitting for a miracle since there were no people living millions of years ago. Um, the theological purpose of signs and wonders would be lost. Together, the biblical and scientific evidence uh, strongly points strongly points toward a God who chose to use regular change, chains of cause and effect to bring about the world that we see today and that we live in. Natural laws are mere descriptions of God's regular activity. How much time, Prose? You have basically around 13 minutes. I've been talking for 13 minutes. No, you've talked for seven minutes, so I'm thinking... Oh, I'm sorry, eight minutes. Oh. I'm sorry, I thought it was 20 minute openings. My bad. Uh, yeah, okay. Cool. So natural laws are merely descriptions of God's regular activity in nature. I'll say that again because it's important. Natural laws, the laws of nature, they are merely human descriptions of God's regular activity in nature. Since God is the creator and sustainer of all physical laws, he clearly has the freedom and the ability to supersede those laws when he wishes. Miracles are simply cases where God chooses to work outside his usual patterns. In the Bible, miracles always point to something. They're not done or performed simply for amazement, entertainment, etc. Um, but they happen to demonstrate God's existence. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. They're not performed to demonstrate God's existence. Like um, one guy talks about, you know, if, if God... Uh, made a gold brick appear in his lap, I, in his, in his lap, I would believe in him. Um, but the miracles that happened in the Bible and still happen today um, happen because they testify to the kingdom of God. Many Christians uh, accept both mainstream science, which points to God working through regular patterns to sustain his creation, as well as miracles, which testify to his strength, oh, sorry, to his character and kingdom. So here we are in the 21st century, and we're at the stage where even serious atheist thinkers um, are having to re-examine the kind of naturalism that reduces everything to physics and chemistry. A good example is Thomas Nagel um, from New York, and uh, I'll quote him here. He says, "Something, something is going wrong. If everything can be can be reduced down to physics and chemistry, then so is your mind." But then why would you trust your mind? In other words, atheism taken to its logical conclusion undermines the very rationality you need to trust to do science. And how can you support a worldview that undermines the foundations of any kind of argument or discussion whatsoever? So it sort of seems today that it's easy to push back on the naive notion that um, God doesn't exist or God is out because we do science now. But science actually brings God back or brings God in, believe it or not. All right, so I'm almost finished. Um, the Apostle Paul tells us that life from death began through Jesus Christ. The eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ believed that they saw him physically rise from the dead after his crucifixion. Five minutes, warning, about five minutes left. Okay, almost finished, almost finished. If the people that claimed to see him, and there was a lot, were wrong, then Christianity has been founded on a lie. But if they were right, such a miracle would substantiate all that Jesus said about um, himself, about God, and about us. And us is us who are the Amagio Dei. Um, 
but was but must we take the resurrection of Christ by faith alone, or is this solid historical evidence? A lot of skeptics have begun investigations into the historical record to prove the resurrection account false. Uh, and what did they come up with? Well, they come up with a lot of things. According to the eyewitnesses at the time, a man named Jesus Christ demonstrated his power over death. They tell us that he died on that Roman cross and was buried and then suddenly appeared to them alive on the third day. And then he was seen by many other people, including 500 people on a single occasion. Soon, word spread everywhere that Jesus had written, risen from the dead. Um, but is, is it based on verifiable historical evidence? Well, I contend that it is. Because um, <laughs> here's the thing, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, and that tomb was not empty on that Sunday morning, the foundation for the Christian faith would be forever destroyed. So we start at circa 700 years before the birth of Christ, and the prophet Isaiah had written about a future Messiah who would suffer and die for our sins, but they'd be restored to life. Jesus claimed that he was that Messiah who would be betrayed, arrested, condemned, spit upon, scourged, and killed. But three days later, he would come back to life. Everything that Jesus taught and claimed depended on his resurrection from the dead. If Christ didn't rise as he promised, the message of forgiveness and hope for eternal life would be meaningless. So as um, English New Testament scholar Wilbur Smith explains, uh, Jesus, when Jesus said he would rise again from the dead the third day after he was crucified, he said something that only a fool or an idiot would dare to say if he expected the devotion of any of his followers, unless, unless he was 100% sure that he was going to rise. So now um, I'm going to hand my time over to, to my learned opponent and for my interlocutor to prove that there is no good evidence for God, he's going to have to tear down um, the historical factual accounts of the resurrection and I yield my time there. So, uh, thank you for your opening, Gavin. You had about three, two, about three, three minutes to spare. We could add that later into the open discussion if you guys want to. But I, good opening, and we'll hand it off to Mark now. And I'm sure it'll be a good opening as well. And whenever Mark, whenever you want me to start it, I'll start the timer. Yeah, sure. Uh, I probably won't use as much time, so I'll try to try to go through um, as fast as I can to, to match Gavin's time, which will be fantastic. Um, so greetings, everybody, brothers and sisters, fellow hominoids, humans, all. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I want to thank uh, Praise and Gavin for being here. Um, um, all of the people watching, thank you for coming and uh, listening to this debate. Um, and, and taking the time to, to listen to me. So this is my second round at uh, uh, Good Evidence for God, um, this time against uh, um, my fellow interlocker, Gavita Herleman, um, whom I uh, haven't yet met, but uh, we, he should provide us with solid and reliable evidence for God. And just as a side note, um, why I'm basically debating today, um, I, I do enjoy debating and I do enjoy debate, but um, basically he asked me to. Um, so, you know, uh, I, after we were in a sort of a chat room, he challenged me to a debate and I just uh, expected. So um, if at any time you feel that I'm being argumentative or disagreeing too much with Gavin, do keep in mind in a very literal sense, he asked for it. Okay, so what, what out of the gate, what constitutes solid and reliable evidence? Um, I know what I use, the methodology, the, the way that we examine demonstrable evidence, um, and that's the scientific methods, and I'll just quickly, very, very quickly, base level, go through what, what that actually is. So the scientific method is a process of observation, questioning, research, hypothesis, experimentation with an effort for falsification to prove it wrong. Um, then a conclusion is made and then that's communicated to the rest of the scientific community to repeat the same results. Um, this repeatability is, is called um, robustness. It's basically how, how all the different people can do the same experiment and come up with exactly the same answer. And that's, that's shown when you do sort of repeated experiments and confirmation experiments to confirm the original one. Um, um, so that's what communication, that's how science works. It's, it's a group 
shared effort that all come up with the same answer through rigorous, repeated, robust experiments. Um, now, the scientific method is responsible for nearly every advance we have today. If you can name it, it's responsible for it. That's medicine, engineering, computing, biology, geology, aviation, chemistry, every single thing, the internet that we're currently on, the Wi-Fi that you're using, everything. Now, the, 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 the scientific methodologies are the best way. There is no better methodology that I'm aware of to determine the models about reality and what's true and what's false. So in comparison, what has religion done, and not the people, not good works they have done, but what have they done to advance our knowledge? And that's not much. The same rhetoric now has, has been for thousands and thousands of years, and we have the same disagreements that we had thousands of years ago there's been no change whatsoever and nothing has been solidified as knowledge about God or about his capabilities that we weren't discussing thousands of years ago. Um, religion hasn't provided clean water. It hasn't created blueprints for bridges. It hasn't gotten a single plane into the air. Um, dogma and prayer does not seem capable of producing anything besides more dogma and prayer. Um, and, and there is no such thing as creationist science. It doesn't, it doesn't exist, or religious science doesn't exist. Um, in Kitzmiller versus Dover, Michael Behe, who was a uh, ID proponent, was forced to concede. He conceded this, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this outright. There are no peer-reviewed articles by anyone advocating for intelligent design supported by pertinent experimentation, experimentation calculations. I'll repeat that again, sorry, I did slip up. There are no peer-reviewed articles by anyone advocating for intelligent design supported by pertinent experimentation calculations. Um, and Justice John E. Jones concluded that intelligent design was religion and not science, and that was the outcome of Kitz Miller versus Dover. And I'll repeat that. Intelligent design was religion and not science. Um, so let's go through, and, and so that's, that's science, that's what I would consider to be good evidence because of its reliability, its ability to produce results and advancements, um, its robustness, its rigorousness. Um, uh, uh, by the way, uh, some of these terms, by the way, if you uh, uh, so robustness I've already explained, it's sort of that, that multiple people can come up with the same conclusion when repeating the same methodology, that's robustness. And what's rigorous? Uh, a rigorous um, uh, in science is that you've covered all of the uh, possibilities that, that you've gone through thoroughly and checked out every possibility and not just settled on one, the, say the first one that comes along. That would be rigor in science. Now, what's bad evidence? Well, for a start, personal revelation. So personal revelation is terrible evidence because it is not evident. Um, it, it may be good evidence to one person, but it's not good evidence to anybody else. Um, and I would kind of point to the Salem witch trials. Um, uh, that was February 1692 to May 1693. And during that time, the courts decided that spectral evidence was not allowed. So what spectral evidence? Their dreams, visions, apparitions, revelations. They, they haven't been permitted in any court ever since because they're so unreliable. And we know they're unreliable um, because two people's revelations can be of wildly different things about the same same person. And, and this is what was happening. Um, they're, they're no better than dreams or visions or, or sort of prophecies. They, they don't allow it in a court of law for a good reason. It is not good evidence. Um, also, anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal evidence, you can find for anything, literally anything. Uh, there's anecdotal evidence for Bigfoot, aliens, fairies, almost anything on the internet. Um, police know that, that eyewitness accounts are good, but they are limited, and eyewitness accounts are unreliable. 
they naturally are. You need supporting evidence with eyewitnesses accounts to, to make a case because they are unreliable. Uh, memories are faulty, experiments and repeatability and rigorousness and robustness is not. Um, so, and the third type was historical evidence. Now, historical evidence can be good or bad depending on who wrote it, where it's coming from, the reason that they wrote it. For instance, the, the emperors of Rome, no one doubts that they wrote that the emperors were gods for personal gain. It definitely was something they were trying to achieve and to, you know, cow the population. And there is a lot of this over the years. So historical documents have been fabricated and they're not reliable unless they have um, a solid evidence to back them up or they're reliable as a form of probability. You know, how probable was this? Um, and that's how historical documents are, are, are uh, evaluated. Um, so my main questions tonight for Gavin. So what methodology is Gavin using? What process of steps and, and uh, uh, um, things that he is doing is he using to make sure he has reached the right conclusion? And how is Gavin ensuring that the method he is using is actually reliable? Where can it produce reliability? And can the method that Gavin's been using be replicated by anyone to reach the same conclusion? And that's about me. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll turn it back to praise. I realize that's very early, but yep, that's all I've got down. Yeah, you had about seven minutes to spare-ish, but uh, I appreciate your opening, Mark, and um, we'll now head into the next portion in, in our debate, the 10-minute cross-exam rebuts. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure, like, if you guys want to pick, I, I'm not sure how you guys want to uh, go about that. Do you want to do just rebuttals, or do one, like, how are you going to work that out? Like, I, I don't, uh, I don't mind. I, I don't mind. I mean, we can just do rebuttals if you'd like. Um, I wouldn't <laughs> mind, because Gavin went through a whole, <laughs> probably a lot more than I did, so I, I'd, I'd, I wouldn't mind a chance to sort of address some of the things I've got down here. Sure. So yeah. is that okay, Gavin, the rebuts? Yeah, I'm just wondering, Mark, how would you feel about if, if we, like, take turns? I'll ask you a question, then you ask me a question, then I'll ask you a question, and that kind of thing. How, how does that sound? Um, I mean, I, I suppose we can do that during the, the open, but, um, like, there, there is a lot down here I do, I do have to address, so um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how many questions you've got. Um, yeah, I, yeah, so... Yeah, how about we do this? We'll do, so uh, Gavin can do his question on you, Mark. I mean, you can decide to do the same or do your rebuts, so either one. <clears throat> uh, okay, all right, I, I guess so. Um... Um, yeah, man, <laughs> you've still got seven minutes. You, you, I don't mind if you, take, if you need some more time. No, 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 that's fine. Okay, okay, well... Um, I almost fell off my chair when I heard you say that religion's done nothing. I'm pretty sure you said religion's done nothing for... To further advancement, yes. Yeah, yep. to further advance, to further advance what? Humanity. Progress, yeah. So technological progress, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe maybe you could point something out that that religion itself, instead of you know people using religious people using the scientific methodology, but sort of you know yeah. faith and prayer has done to progress humanity's understanding of the world. Sure, sure. So, um, no. If we if we're talking religion, you know, I'm I'm going to be uh, when I say religion, I'm meaning Christianity. So. Okay. Sure. As far as, far as progress is concerned, I'm. I'm a bit shocked and amazed. Um, for example, um, <laughs> this is not progress, but th there's a reason why why time why time is is marked into BC and AD. It, it means something pretty important happened, and um, there's well, if it's not the, progress, the Bible, then it's then my my statement's true. Well, hold on, hold on. 
um, I didn't say it was progress. I'm just I'm just making a point. But something important happened for time to be marked between BC and AD. Now the Bible is um, the the most uh, printed, most produced, most sold, and most widely distributed book in the entire history of mankind. So does that mean entire if the Quran, Quran was printed more in the next century, it would be true? No, no. Now you've got to no. remember. No, this it is, doesn't. This is you know, no, 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 no. The Bible is is the most produced, most widely distributed, and most sold book in the entire history of mankind. That is a fact. Now there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Now there's been probably close to a hundred great universities that have been established to spread the teaching and the education of Christianity. These would include Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, Columbia and Oxford. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, probably. I'm a bit confused. I do apologize, but I'm not hearing any questions in here. And... Right, Gavin, could you could you form your response into a question? Okay, okay. Sorry, I'm just so a bit Mark... confused over what's what's happening because right. yeah. this sounds like just yeah. a statement of rebuttal rather than questions, okay. so I'm a bit okay. confused. Yeah, so uh, I'm saying, yeah, Gavin, so put, yeah, form your question, I mean, yeah, form your comments into a question or just do rebuttals, and uh, okay. you, you have about eight minutes. Yeah, all right. So, so, so Mark, you're saying that Christianity, you call it religion, I'll call it Christianity, I, I don't really care. Well, I can mix my um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you're saying it's provided no progress um, for mankind, but then how would you contend with the universities? Um, that have been established um, to, to spread um, education and, and the teaching of Christianity. And I mean, I, I mean, universities like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, Columbia, Oxford. How would you contend with that? These are all Christian based universities. Well, I mean, it might be Christians that established them, but the doctrine itself was not what caused the universities to make progress. The universities themselves use the scientific method to make progress, not faith, dogma, and, and prayer. So the method that they use isn't religious based, it's it's secular, it's science. Um, <clears throat> now, um, just for my question, um, so you say that there's sort of 500 eyewitnesses accounts in the Bible, but yeah, what we don't have is the eyewitnesses. So, who were these eyewitnesses, and if if they are eyewitnesses, why can't we speak to them today? Um, because they did. <laughs> they died. They died two thousand odd years ago. So, are they eyewitnesses? They were witnesses at the time, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, are you aware that uh, the USA, the United States of America, was founded, was founded um, on Christian principles? Uh, that's a loaded question, incredibly loaded question. Are you aware of, and then make a statement for a start. So... You know, and I completely refute that. The the founding fathers are mostly deists. They're not Christians. Wow. That's actually not true. No, really? There was 55, yeah, there was 55 um, signatories um, who, were, who were known colloquially as the founding fathers, and 54 of them were Bible-believing Christians. There was four deists, I think. Okay, so... Um, my next question is, what does that have to do with whether Christianity is true or not? Just because the U.S. founding the U.S. founding fathers couldn't have been Satanists for all that matters, what what does that have any impact on whether it's true or not? Well, um, the founding fathers um, <laughs> they were Christians for a good reason. There must have been a good reason for them to be Christians. Would you agree? Uh, I would agree that they had a reason, whether it's a good reason or whether it's due to their upbringing is, a, is another story. 
but you'd agree being a Christian would be, be better than being a Satanist. I don't know. I mean, I've read the Satanic Bible, and it's not exactly that bad, to be honest with you. Wow. I've met a few Satanists, okay. and they seem like perfectly nice people. Okay. Wow. So I, I don't. Okay. I, well, I don't think I could say that. Hey, um, one religion is better than another. Generally, I think you have to look at who the people are and and what whether they're good people or not. I've met good people from all religions. I'm sorry, I don't I don't elevate Christianity in the way you do because I'm not a Christian. Um, no, that's fine. That's fine. But I elevate Christianity to where it is because anything else, um, particularly Satanism, is patently ridiculous. So I've got a question here. So Christianity... Christianity, as far as progress is concerned, is at the very foundation of such humanitarian efforts like Red Cross, um, World Vision... Sorry to interrupt, Gavin. Gavin. Sorry to interrupt. That's just, it's my question now, mate. Is it? Yeah. Um, we actually have three minutes. We can finish this period, yeah. Um, so you said that the regularities of nature were trustworthy and consistent. Um... So how do the irregularity of nature, which you called miracles, how are they trustworthy and consistent? Oh, you'll, see, you'll see in my um, list of references, there's reference to um, a two-volume set called Miracles written by Kraft Tina. And these are miracles that have been documented using um, medical, medical notes and um, information from... Uh, the patients, um, medical people, their doctors, their specialists, etc. So you can look at that. So here's here's here's, here's a question. You say you say that you know religion, Christianity, has, has not provided any progress um, for mankind. But Jesus Christ placed enormous value uh, on each person, regardless of their sex or their race. All right. Now, he led his followers to promote the rights of women as well as um, to abolish slavery. So, so how how is that not progress? How is that not progress in man in, as far as mankind's concerned? Well, you've got a story about what a person allegedly said. It, it's a story. Um, now he may have. But there isn't good evidence to say that he did. It's just, just a story. We don't know who wrote the Bible, most of it. Um, traditionally, it's been associated with the apostles. But, um, you know, we don't know for sure who wrote it. So we don't know for sure what Jesus said. And that's not reliable. Because we don't know who wrote it, why they wrote it, how much was made up, how much they put in. For instance, there's stuff in there about uh, handling snakes and being able to drink poison that was not in earlier copies. We know it was added. And so the Pentecostals who handle snakes and think they can drink poison without being ill, that was added later. We don't know how much was added because we don't have the originals. Bart Ehrman, Dr. Bart Ehrman went through that one. He's absolutely right. Now, it's quite possible that Jesus said all of these things and put this into practice, but it's not really progress that, 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 that I'm talking about. So I'm going to have to so, jump in here really quick. So that sure. ends Gavin's um, cr uh, cross-examination period, but now let's, you're, it's on, uh, we'll, we'll hand it off to you, Mark, and you can either do rebuttals or cross-examine so we'll give it we'll give it well, to you i think it's one. unfair if gavin gave up his rebuttal i should probably do the same to be to be fair so um you okay. know I'm, I'm happy for the back and forth questioning to go as well um you know i've got a lot of questions as well so so go for it gavin it's, sure. it's your uh wait no that was it's my question so i'm even i'm getting lost in the source on this one um <laughs> um uh so you said that that paul witnesses Jesus rise from the dead. Um, and I want to ask, did Paul witness Jesus rise from the dead or did he hear a voice and witness light? 
Now, Paul didn't, Paul didn't witness Christ rise from the dead. He had an encounter with Christ on the, the Damas Damascus Road. He was traveling to Damascus, um, and he had an encounter with Christ. Did he see Jesus rise from the dead? He saw... Did he see Joyce? No, I just said to you, he didn't see Jesus rise right, from the dead. Right, Okay. Sorry. Go for it again. Yeah. Okay. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty, um, <laughs> I'm blown away by this um, uh, Christianity or religion is, is not provided progress to me, to, hum, to humanity. Um, Christianity is at the foundation of humanitarian efforts like Red Cross, World Vision, um, Salvation Army. Um, how do you how do you contend with these um, organisations who take the words of Christ really seriously to be servants? You know, oh, to, well, to, look thought... after, to look after the, the the unloved, the unwanted, um, the poor, the needy, the hungry, that 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 sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, I, I definitely addressed this in, in my opening. I said that the church has done good, or, you know, Christianity has done good, mostly through the actions of good people. Um, so I'm not contending that the church hasn't done good, but when what I'm contending is that the church has advanced our understanding of reality or made progress on our knowledge. Because we're still arguing the same things thousands of years later that we were thousands of years ago. The, the nature of God is still being argued when it was being argued in the ancient Greek days and, and earlier. I mean, it's, it's nothing has changed on that front in any way, shape or form. And I mean, it's interesting that you say, OK, you know, I'm blown away by you contending that, that you know, the church or Christianity hasn't made any progress or advancement or, you know, that kind of thing. But you can't actually name anything that it's done. So it's, it's your turn for a question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so with Christianity, you say you've got onlookers, which is anecdotal evidence. Why should I consider the anecdotal evidence in your book to be reliable and the anecdotal evidence in other religious texts not to be reliable? Because the information in the Bible has been uh, much of the information in the Bible, not all of it, because you know a lot of it happened a long time ago, but much of it has been corroborated by uh, modern archaeology, and also by the enemies of of Christianity. The best the best witnesses you can have um for your cause are your enemies you know people that are not on your side so either romans uh, jews or pagans that kind of thing so i've got a question i've got a question for you um you you you, you said you mentioned something about name something that religion has done i think it was something like that well the first the very first scientists, the very first scientists were were God believers. They were Christians because they were relying, they were relying on the regularity and the laws of nature to remain the same, so they could investigate further um, into the things of God. So science, science has been birthed has been birthed from Christianity, from religion. In the, in the Western, in the Western um, uh, in our Western civilization, sorry. Is so that's what that, that that's one positive for, for progress, isn't it? Is there a like question somewhere? Oh okay, so that's your question, isn't that progress? Okay, so people birthed science like it was birthed by people and everybody at that time was religious so the question arises what other people than religious people is it going to come from but the 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 fact is that that scientific 
revolution or that that um, advancement of, of scientific uh, uh, fundamentals, the church opposed and Christianity opposed. I mean, you only have to look to things like uh, Copernicus with him, you know, sort of pr suggesting the heliocentric model and having it to sort of take it back later and say that he didn't actually mean it because he was afraid of being burnt by the church. Um, it hasn't always been, well, the religion is promoting these scientific values. In fact, you'll find very much the opposite. Um, and But that's true of all religion, that whether that be Christianity or Islam with their golden age of, of Islamic uh, uh, discovery and then being sort of squashed by the Islamic uh, priests. Um, it hasn't always... And just because people who are religious discover things doesn't mean that they've they've done it in a in a or it doesn't mean that it's the religion taking credit for it oh, i think i think i think if you if you investigate um science you know in great detail you'll find that um uh, religion particularly christianity was was responsible for the for the major advances in science for example, the scientific method, you know. Um, um, I think it's my question. Well, yeah. yeah, I'm not asking. I'm not asking a question. I'm not asking a question. I'm answering. For, uh, for example, the scientific method, you know, um, what? was I invented by. I didn't ask a question. What What are you answering? I don't understand. I thought you, I thought you make you were making a statement. I was answering the, the the statement you were making. Yeah. So this is this is why um, you know we were doing questions. You wanted questions rather than rebuttal kind of thing. And I think this is probably best handled in the open, where both of us can have a back and forth about um, you know the the position that we're taking. Okay. So, so do you have a question for yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. I was just sorry. I was just finding my notes here. Um, so, you said that science describes God's regular activity. How and where does does science describe it? Do you have any papers on God that is describing God's regular activity? The laws of nature are an example of God's regular activity. Well, the question was, do you have any papers? describing God, this as being God's regular activity. You mean like peer-reviewed papers? Sure, yeah. No, no, because see, God, God is something that science can't investigate. Science doesn't have the utilities to investigate God. Uh, to, to your question, Kevin. Right. So, you, you you made the statement that it seems today that <clears throat> the argument between the non-believers and the believers, <clears throat> particularly as far as Christianity is concerned, concerned has, has still remained the same that it has been uh, from thousands of years ago. Now, I would push back against that by, by simply saying this. How, would you, how, do, how do you contend... <clears throat> How do you contend with the fact that um, people with no religious um, affiliation, agnostics and atheists, are projected projected to shrink in size, we're talking globally, like globally, are projected to shrink in size um, over the coming decades despite a flourishing um, an expanding world population. Um, I, I don't know where you're getting that data from. The um, the nuns or no religion is actually the fastest growing demographic around the world. And while still small, um, you have a trend towards secularism, especially in the first world. And and you know, um, I, I do I do acknowledge that religions are growing significantly in the third world, but not not in the developed world. Um, so I, I, a, I don't know where you got that information from. And number two, I've got no idea what it's got to do with whether a God proposition is true or false. It's just simply right, guys, a um, argument here. from popularity. Really quick. Um, so that, that concludes our cross-examination period. We're just going to open it up now for a half hour cross 
uh, cross dialogue or open, open, uh, yeah. So open discussion, and then we'll go into the closing and then audience Q and A. And go ahead, guys. We'll let you continue on. Oh, fantastic! Thank you, <laughs> thank you, praise. Um, yeah, but well, something I really wanted to uh, ask. Can I, I can, can I answer that question that you asked? Where, where, where's where's my um, information coming from about the shrinking? Yeah, sure, shrinking sure. Size? Yeah. There's there, there's a uh, <laughs> there's an institute in Washington D.C. called the Pew Research Center. Yeah, and they're commissioned by governments and multinationals. Yeah, statistical basically research center, yeah. Basically, collect data. Yeah, so mm -hmm. <clears throat> they're basically glorified bean counters. So the data comes from them. Yeah, and um, according to them, according to them, over the coming decades, well, actually, at the moment, at the moment, um, people who are uh, of no religious affiliation are atheists or agnostics mm -hmm. um, occupy about 16% of the global population. Over the coming decades, based on, on birth and death, marriage rates and all that kind of thing. Oh, you're that talking about 16 births. The, the atheists and agnostics generally have less births, for instance. The the, the, the study showed that that number, 16% of the global population, is projected to shrink to 13% of the global population over the coming decades. So I don't think things have remained the same as far as the believers and the non-believers. It seems to me that the data is indicating that the non-believers as a group are actually shrinking despite the global population expanding. Yeah, I, I don't think that's true. I think that what you're doing is misreading a paper that's saying that agnostics and atheists have less children, and so they're going to birth less atheists and agnostics, and you're misinterpreting that. Because if that would be true, that would be 100% true, if that's the only way atheists and agnostics came about was through birth. But it's not. They deconvert as well. So I think that you're misunderstanding a study from the Pew Research Centre and ascribing this idea that, that athe atheism or secular um, um, side of, of society is actually shrinking when in, in fact it's not. And it certainly isn't I've in actually, the Scandinavian countries and, and you know, Europe yeah. and things. It's definitely not shrinking there. Yeah, well, but, I've, I've actually, but, I've included... But Gavin, on, that doesn't, on. that the hold second on. part, you've also got to address the yeah. second part, right? What's that got to do with whether or not the God proposition is true? Or, you know, and, and more accurately, whether there's good evidence for God. Is popularity yeah. good evidence? Yeah. Okay, so um, I've included uh, that Pew Research data in my citation, so you can fact check it. Um, okay, sure. When, when you want. But, but there's, there, there's the so, question yeah. out there. Is popularity good evidence? Well, <clears throat> let's think about this. Let's think about this. The world population is expanding, obviously, you know, because more people are being born. Um, the number of people who are not religious, that includes the atheists, the, the agnostics, and people of no religious affiliation whatsoever. Despite an increasing global population, that group of non-believing people, people that do not believe in God, is getting smaller. Okay, let's, for the sake of argument, because I don't want to, you know, get stuck on this point, let's say that's true. Let's say I can see that's absolutely true, and atheists are going to go down to 5% or 2% or 1% of the population. It doesn't address the fact that what you're describing is an argument from popularity. It's a logical fallacy. It's basically saying whatever is the most popular. There is research that also says that Islam is going to overtake Christianity. Will that make Islam true? I've actually read that. Yeah, I've read yeah. that. So I've does that mean that yeah. Islam is actually the true one because that will overtake Christianity? Um, <clears throat> not to me, no. Not no, to you. Not to me. What do you mean I, to you? Is because, there... I know, because I know the, the background and the history of Islam. Are things true to you that are not true in reality? 
like is is it a, just a personal opinion of what is true and what is not is that just you know something can be true for me like you know my coffee cup is here but not true for you no no, no. Okay, my so, truth is based on so, my truth is based on evidence so what's true does not based upon popularity it's not good evidence because if if islam can overtake christianity and be more popular and that's still not true then popularity is not good evidence for what is true and what is not um for for a group of people to shrink to shrink in size right despite a flourishing and expanding global population that means something and it doesn't mean anything good what for that mean? group of people what what does it mean um i would think that it means uh as technology advances as the mission as the mission field expands and more people come into a knowledge of jesus christ and a saving grace more people are going to turn to religion but it's that's not what actually, the data seems to indicate. it's not actually good evidence that that what you're saying is actually true it's just not what the data how can yeah. you argue with data well it's an argument from how popularity i'm not arguing with the data <laughs> i'm arguing with your interpretation that because something is not popular or becomes less popular it becomes less true it's got an argumentum ad populum it's a it's a well known very very well known logical fallacy and it basically yeah, because um, you yourself said if something becomes more popular than christianity it doesn't make it true if christianity shrank to one percent of the population it still would either be true or false regardless of the amount of people believing in it wouldn't you agree by by the year 2055 Pew research center um have indicated this is projections right projections so it's never going to be a hundred percent empirical sure, sure. no that's fine that's fine no i understand projection that's fine yeah their projections are that three quarters three quarters of the global population is either going to be christian or muslim they've also projected that the current 16 percent of the global population who are not believers will get smaller now there's got to be a reason why they're getting smaller okay you seem a little stuck on this so i'll put this another way if if christianity became five percent of the population and suddenly atheism spiraled out of control and went up to you know 90 percent of the population would that make christianity any more true or less true or would it have nothing to do with it um that's a pretty it's a pretty weird kind of no, it's, a, it's a hypothetical it's just a hypothetical that's yeah. all it is yeah but it's but it's a weird it's a weird hypothetical it's Why? pretty weird Why's that well like it would ever happen well that's what a hypothetical is you know and not doesn't necessarily have to happen it just it just is a hypothetical yeah, I, I i try i try not to um get involved with hypotheticals yeah so I'd rather, I'd rather okay all right rather well, let's, let's go for something solid know. then it, it, uh, at, a, at the turn of the century say most people believe that the earth was flat kind of thing or you know maybe 200 300 400 years ago whatever um believe that most people does was the, the world was flat does that have any impact on the actual shape of the world no no and neither does it whether, so this seems to be a god to me if i may guys maybe we can focus on maybe one subject at the resurrection because i know gavin you yeah. are very motivated on that yeah. one so okay, go ahead. Sure. Because my, my my opening statement was was talking about the resurrection, um, Mark, and and I said um, for my interlocutor, which is you, <laughs> my Aussie neighbour. I'm aware. Yeah. Um, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but your act, your act, man, your accent is just like a New Zealander's. Hey, eh? it's, it's not Australian at all. No, it's WA. So, it's a it's a very very sort of area specific yeah. one. So. So for my interlocutor, which is you, um, to be able to 
um, provide evidence that God did not exist, because that's what you're contending. You're contending that there's no good evidence for God. You would have to tear down the historical evidence of the resurrection. Okay, so I'll well, just clear up first uh, a common misconception about the, the weak atheist position that I take. Um, I, I'm not contending that God, I know that God does not exist. That's not what I'm contending. I'm saying I lack belief that there is a God because no good evidence has been presented to me. So I'm, I don't have a burden of proof to prove something doesn't exist. That's shifting the burden of proof. So you're the one that's claiming a God does exist. I am not claiming that I know a God doesn't exist. I'm just claiming that I reject your claim because it has not met its burden of proof. So let's let's clear that up so we know where we our positions and where we stand. Okay, so hold on, hold on. Yeah. I think this is quite important. So sure. you're contending that you don't have a burden of proof. Correct, yes. Well, that's not what we agreed to in our email correspondence. Uh, what do is you it? mean? I don't remember in our email the burden of proof at all. Well, in our email correspondence, you agreed that you would bring to the table a positive argument or positive evidence that there was no good evidence for God. Uh, I, 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 would, I would be debating. I was debating. do the reverse. So I'm debating the proposition that there is no good evidence for God, and all I have to do to show that is rebut your evidence. That shows no, that... that's not how it works. No, well, that's not. Um, no. I'm, and you're, and, and, I'm sorry, and you're but, but like a proposition, there is good evidence for God. There is an affirmative and a negative. I'm taking the negative position. There is no good evidence for God. I don't have right. to show so, that God right. does not exist. All I have to do Absolutely. is demonstrate there is no good evidence to believe that a God does exist. Well, the easiest way to clear this up is to, is to look at the email correspondence, isn't it? Sure. The prize, have you got that there? Um, yeah, but I'm not sure if that's, I mean, I don't feel like just going through all that right now, right in the middle of a debate, but I do have it, yes, I do, if you want to quickly right. say something about that, I will, I'll, I'll address well, that. Well, I think, I think, um, you have a burden of proof, Mark, and that, that burden of proof is to provide evidence that there is no good evidence for God, because I'm going to provide that there is good evidence for God, um, you cannot sit there and just say, I'm not convinced or your evidence is not convincing enough to me. You have to bring an argument to the table oh, I am. that show why there is no good evidence for God. Oh, I am. But how do I show no evidence? How do I show a lack that's, of evidence? That's your, that's your position. <laughs> that's, that's your position. Yeah, my position is your your burden of proof has not met its, its uh, sorry, your claim has not met its burden of proof. That's that's my my position. I don't need to sure. take a, I can show sure. that God does not exist. So you're conflating the two positions. You're conflating. No, no. I have no, no good no. evidence to believe that there's a God, and I have evidence that a God does not exist. You're conflating the two. Okay. So so can we hear um, your your evidence that there is no good evidence for God? Yeah, so as I've pointed out, the Bible is, is merely a story that we don't know who wrote it and is not good evidence at all. Um, sort of the, the eyewitnesses that you've gone into are not eyewitnesses because we can't, they don't, a, a person wrote down that there was 500 eyewitnesses. I could write down that there's 500 witnesses to me doing a somersault off my roof. It doesn't mean it happened and it doesn't mean I have eyewitnesses. It's just a story. Um, there's also contradictory things between um, your uh, religion and other religions, things that cannot exist side by side. For instance, the Hindu religion where Shiva is the creator and destroyer of the universe, that cannot exist side by side with your God, but for some reason you place your evidence at a much higher rate, at a much higher credibility than any of their evidence. So I, you know, and you say that they're wrong, they say you're wrong, 
you know, uh, Islam says that both of you are wrong. I agree with all of you. I think you're all wrong. Okay. So how does that how does that um, tear down uh, the historical fact of the resurrection? Well, I don't think it's a historical fact. I think that it's, it may be a historical fact that Jesus was a real person. I, I, not a, I don't take the mythicist position, but I don't think there's enough evidence and, and certainly not reliable evidence to think that he performed any kind of miracle or any kind of supernatural feat at all. Um, the, the, the eyewitnesses and things that you say, we, we don't know who they were. We don't know who wrote it. We, we don't know much about it at all. Who were the um, eyewitnesses? <clears throat> who, who witnessed this? Well, well there's... Well, there's, there's the... Well, for a start, there's the disciples, right? There's the women that were at the tomb. Did they see him um, rise from the dead? Like, I mean, were they in the tomb to see him come alive? Correct. Did they see him rise from the dead? Or did they have somebody afterwards claim they rose from the dead? No, no. No, no, no. Um, did they see him rise from the dead? The, the tomb where Jesus was buried was mm. well known to everybody. Right, mm -hmm. because it was owned by Jesus, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, and it was empty on the, the Sunday morning. Then you have evidence of an empty tomb. The empty tomb doesn't prove the resurrection. It doesn't demonstrate it, and it's not good evidence for it either. The resurrection proves the empty tomb, Mike. Uh, Mark. So. Well, the, the resurrection proves the empty tomb. The empty tomb doesn't prove the resurrection. The resurrection proves the empty tomb. Can you care to run that by me? I, I don't understand how a resurrection proves an empty tomb. Well, there would be... If Jesus did not resurrect, yeah. his body would still be in the tomb on, on uh, Sunday morning, wouldn't it? No, that, that's a claim that the empty tomb proves the resurrection. Not the other way around. No, 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 I'm not saying the empty tomb proves the resurrection. I'm saying the resurrection is the reason why that tomb was empty on Sunday morning. But, but I mean, uh, evidence isn't about um, what causes things. You know, you, and evidence is what demonstrates it to be true. Okay, so... What I'm going to run through is uh, enemy attestation of the of the resurrection. So these are people that were hostile to Christians. Okay, so the earliest account is from someone called Thallus, and that was in 52 AD, and he is referred to by uh, Julian Africanus. Julian Africanus was writing around 221 AD. Okay, what do you say? Um, and uh, Julian Af Africanus um, quotes Thallus, uh, who Thallus was trying to explain away the darkness that occurred on the land and also the earthquake that happened when Christ, Christ physically died. So Thallus writes the following, on the, whole, on the whole word that pressed the most fearful darkness, the rocks were rent by an earthquake and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus, in, his, in the third book of his history, calls, as appears to me, without reason, an eclipse of the sun. Well, um, eclipses happen, and, we're aware of that. Yeah, but, Julius of the Panis, chronography 18.1. Well, sure, I mean, eclipses do happen, and, and I, I, I'm not familiar with the particular historian, but I mean, in the Bible it also says that um, the saints rose from their graves and wandered around the city. Do they have evidence of that as well? That's probably hyperbolic language. What do you mean? I would say. Well, I mean, doesn't the Bible doesn't the Bible say that the saints cracked open their sepulchres and walked the city? Doesn't it say that? Yeah, it does. But yeah, you're, so um, do you have evidence of not, that happening? You're not. Um, you're you you're you're not uh, you're not reading the Bible. Um, through the eyes of the first century audience that it was written to, 
Well, no, okay. obviously, because I'm not a first century person. How could I possibly do that? But I would argue you're, you're not reading the Bible through the first century people. You've got, to you've got to remember that the people in the first century lived in what's known as a high context culture, whereas we live in a, a low context culture. Okay. So the people in the first century, the audience in the first century, they would have known um, exactly what the author was saying. And what was the author saying? And what was hyperbolic and, 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 was, and what wasn't. So what was the author so, saying? Sorry? What was the author saying about, you know, the dead saints rose from their graves and walked around the city? What, what was the author saying, if not that the dead rose and walked around the city? What was the author saying? Well, to my mind, that was hyper. That was the genre of hyperbolic writing. Hyperbolic. So it's just hyperbolic. Metaphor. Right. It's, it's a metaphor. Um, more hyperbolic. Uh, hyperbolic, I think. So, did actual dead people rise from their graves and walk around the city, or not? Um, it seems to me that, as I said, that's hyperbolic. The genre of hyperbolic writing. So, well, it, it's a simple question. Did it, did that in in fact happen, or did it not happen? It's it's a very very simple question. If it's hyperbolic writing, um, it's impossible to say whether it happened or not. Yeah. I would tend to think it, it didn't happen. Okay. I would tend to think. So you've got one event in the Bible that it says happened that didn't happen. How do you know that the other events weren't hyperbolic writing as well? Well, that's why we have a discipline called hermeneutics and exegesis, Mark. Yeah, but I so, mean, it could just be that Jesus rising from the dead was hyperbolic language as well. And I, I realize that you say, okay, if that didn't happen, then, you know, Christianity is no more and stuff. And I, I fail to see how that's a reason for it, for it just not being hyperbolic language as well. So moving along. Because I, I know, I know um, non-believers like to get stuck on these one things. Moving along from Thallus. Oh, I think I think these um, get stuck on things as well. You know, I think it's the, the human nature to want to really investigate yeah, stuff. Yeah, I think it's sure. uh, so. So, from what Julian Africanus wrote uh, regarding Thallus, um, his writing showed that uh, Jesus lived. He was crucified. There was an earthquake, earthquake, and darkness at the point of his crucifixion. That's all we can tell from. From what Thallus wrote. So if we look at Cornelius Gaius Tacitus. Right, Could you uh, send over the story. name of that to me? Would be great. Uh, what was it? Thallus, Sorry? you say? Thallus, yeah. T-H-A-L-L-U-S. So we'll move along to another hostile witness who was Tacitus, Gaius Cornelius Tacitus, was a Roman historian. And uh, from his accounts uh, that he wrote about, wrote about Jesus, we can affirm that Jesus lived in Judea, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, had followers who were persecuted for their faith in Christ. Another hostile witness is a Syrian philosopher who's whose name was Mara, M-A-R-A, B-A-R, Maraba Sera Pion, S-E-R-A-P-I-O-N. So just to address Thallus, um, he yep. didn't actually write this himself. He cited somebody else writing in reference. So he's not actually saying it. He's saying that somebody else said it. So it's no, not, no. It's not first hand. It's not second hand. It's not even third. It's a third hand account at best. Thallus's writings are lost. I did say earlier that Julian Africanus, writing about two two hundred twenty one A.D., he quoted Thallus. He quoted Thallus, who previously tried to explain away the darkness. So how do we know Thallus actually wrote it? I because mean, Julian Africanus quotes him. But you said he was an enemy, but wasn't Africanus a Christian? Uh, uh, I mean, just because a Christian says, hey, an enemy of Christianity said this, which backs up my belief, doesn't mean, you know, 
you're saying an enemy of Christianity wrote it, but that's not the case. Africanus was a Christian. Was he? Yes. So he's quoting, he's quoting somebody who was an enemy uh, of no, Christianity. No, 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 no friend of Christianity. Mm. Right. So we're moving along now. I've talked about Tacitus. Okay. So from Tacitus's writings, we we can well, tell that Tacitus, Jesus. Lived, Tacitus that. said that there were people that believed that Christ rose from the dead. He didn't actually say that Christ did rose from the dead. So what? Well, I mean, if I say there's people that believe that Scientology is an alien religion or whatever, it doesn't mean I'm saying that it's true. Tacitus could hardly say he saw Christ rose from the dead. No, no, that's not because what I'm saying. He didn't say that Christ did born, rise from the dead. All he said is that there, pe there are people that believe this thing. It's yeah. not reliable. Yeah. You can't possibly think that's reliable and good evidence for a God when somebody says, hey, there are a bunch of Christians. Because I acknowledge that there are, there are Christians that believe Christ rose from the dead. I, I, I make no dispute over that. It's, it's obviously true. I'm talking to one. But, you know, that doesn't mean that God actually rose from the dead, that, that Jesus rose from the dead. Why not? Well, because the existence of people that believe something doesn't mean that the thing that they believe in is actually true. So, like, if I say, hey, there's people out there that believe in Bigfoot, it doesn't mean I'm saying that Bigfoot is true or exists or, or you know, stalks the, the wild woods of no, Indiana. No, no, I don't what? think that's right. You've got to remember too. Right? You've, got to, you've got to remember one thing, and this is really important. This is always missed. It's always missed by non-believers. The enemies of Christ, the the Jewish chief priests, they were right there in Jerusalem, and they all knew where um, Jesus' tomb was. They all knew where the the tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea was. So they all would have known that that tomb was empty on the Sunday morning. And yet nobody, they would have loved, they would have loved Christ's body to be in that tomb on, on Sunday morning, but it wasn't. And yet they said absolutely nothing. So you've got evidence of an empty tomb. So that's evidence of an empty tomb, but it's not even good evidence because you can't even tell me who these people were. Yeah, the Bible talks about the people that um, were involved with finding the empty tomb. Yeah, in one, one true, book it yeah. says that three women found the empty tomb. In one book it was several women found the empty tomb. In one book yeah. it was one woman yeah. found the empty tomb. We've got a distinct yeah. Yeah, conflict yeah. over who found yeah. the empty yeah. tomb. That sort of yeah. leads that's us to think that the documents because, aren't exactly that, reliable that's, that's because, because they have conflicting because, information in them. That's because, that's because, yeah. when you have different accounts, when you have p different people yeah. giving giving different accounts mm -hmm. of the same thing, mm -hmm. it's quite normal. It's quite normal for the accounts to differ. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? No, I totally agree. Because, you know, as I said about anecdotal evidence, the police know that eyewitness accounts are notoriously unreliable for exactly this reason. People, no. you know, memories are faulty and they come up with different things. It's why it should not be considered reliable evidence by itself. But that's... So Gavin? Oh, we lost Gavin, and I was actually going to jump in anyway because yeah, sure. we're coming up on the 30-minute mark. It's been a great discussion, very respectful, and I appreciate that. The am it's very am amicable, and uh, that's what we want is cordial debates on this channel. So it's, it's been good, and I think both sides make great arguments. So I'll let the, we'll let the audience decide, and we'll have an after show too if people want to come on in and uh, – I'll lay some points out, whatever. But if anyone else has an after show, you can put it in the chat and we can uh, advertise it. No worries. Thanks, Price. Oh, my pleasure, man. Thanks for... Yeah, we appreciate having you, actually. Good stuff. Uh, do you want to give Gavin, like, a couple of minutes or something? Just maybe you maybe can get Yeah, back? yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll give you guys another three to five minutes to conclude it, and then we'll... Then we'll start winding down.
speaking of mods, we got SFTs in the chat of Standing for Truth, and we like to try to be as neutral as possible. I, I, that's what we want to do here, and I'm obviously thinking his channel too. So Hi, hopefully, Standing people. Truth. Yeah, he's a great guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, if Gavin has to come back, we might have to do an early shutdown. But um, we have enough, though. We got some good material, so. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions if you're okay with that. I mean, I don't want Gavin to be, not be able to make, make his case kind of thing. I think that's a bit unfair. Yeah. Um, depending on what you want to do, I don't know whether Gavin would be okay with that. He's probably probably screaming at his internet right now like I just yeah. uh, poor guy um yeah I know it was on his mobile maybe the mobile ran out of charge or something possibly yeah I'm guessing his yeah. power went out that's a shame um yeah we could do questions I have a few of them and I could throw them at you and see how you would address those yeah sure I'll do my best no problem at all cool man um I, I'm just going to give him like a little bit of a grace period here just to come back in. Yeah, sure, and, uh, sure. If you guys want to take a bathroom break, get a drink or something, or the audience, and then we'll conclude her with the question and answer period, whatever. Sure. It's okay, it's my own, never mind. <laughs> Gavin, good stuff. You're back, I think. Hey. Are we there? Sorry about that. No worries, no worries at all. Okay. So, right. Actually, so Gavin, on... we were kind of winding it down. We were the last two minutes. If you guys want to have like an extra two minutes to finish it up, that's fine. And then we'll go into the your concluding remark and then questions and answers. So, um, yeah, go ahead and try to wind this down and then we'll, we'll end, it, we'll end okay. the stream. Um, okay. I'm, I'm happy to um, go to conclusions if, if you are. Gavin, I'm, I'm good. Yep. Um, uh, okay. I'll just, I'll just read, I'll just read, um, one of, uh, a Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus. Well, Josephus' writings were certainly in doubt. They are very hotly contested, I'm sure you'll admit. Um, I agree with you, Mark. I agree mm. with you. Um, I wouldn't say hotly contested. I, I, I would admit that um, there's been interpol interpolations from uh, from Christians, that's for sure. Uh, but I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a Syriac... I've got a Syriac version of jo of Josephus's report about Christ. Um, it's 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 quite short. It's uh, he writes at this time. Remember, he was a Jew. Okay, so he's no he's no friend of Christianity. He writes at this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. 
and many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported, they reported, according to, 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 to Josephus, that he had appeared to them after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets ha have recounted wonders. So that was a Syriac version of uh, Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, book 18, chapter 33, that was written either 93 or 94 AD. Yeah, so um, Josephus, he had some, we know that some of his work was um, changed. Um, yes. Yep. Yep. So we yep. don't know what was actually changed and what was, which, which sort of takes away Josephus' credibility as far as historical accounts are concerned. Um, and even if he said it may have happened, well, that, that isn't good evidence that it did. Like, so what we're talking about is good, reliable evidence, what we can rely on. And if you've got a historian that has had work that's been altered in the past, you no longer have a reliability. Um, same with the Bible. If, it's, if it has been altered in the past, which we know from the Pentecostal handling snakes and drinking poison, it, it, that was added because earlier versions did not have it. The credibility of that document is then highly in question. I think I think the number. Okay, I think there's a few things. One is the number of eyewitnesses that believe they saw Christ alive and well three days after he was dead. The the fact that Christ appeared to individual people, small groups and large groups at different times at different times. That lends credibility to the fact that he did rise from the dead, right? Um, the fact that there was no official time or refutation from the enemies of Christ, who were the, the, the Jewish chief priests, their silence is deafening. Their silence is absolutely deafening. They would have known that tomb was empty on Sunday morning. And um, there was nothing from them whatsoever. Nothing from them whatsoever, and that that word word of Christ um, coming back from the dead, that would have spread like wildfire. Now that that because it's not something that happens every day, right? It's very 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 unusual. So every man and his dog would have known about it or been told about it. Okay, so the number of eyewitnesses, if you know, the, the, you've got a story about the number of eyewitnesses. We can't confirm that they actually existed. So it doesn't matter whether it's 500 or I say, hey, you know, I jumped off the roof and did a somersault. And that's, I've got a thousand eyewitnesses or 10,000 or a million eyewitnesses. It doesn't matter when you're telling a story about eyewitnesses and do not have the eyewitnesses themselves. Um, small groups and large groups, exactly the same thing. I could say there were small groups, there were medium groups, there were large groups, and there were extra large groups. It still doesn't get you any further to whether those groups actually existed or not. And, and whether the story said there was extra small groups as well doesn't add to the credibility in any way, shape, or form. Um, no refutation no, of enemies. Oh, sorry, Praise, if I just could, I'd, I'd very quickly, uh, because that was a lot of points, I'll just address them all. Yeah. No refutation of enemies. There was no confirmation either. Um, the, the Romans didn't write down anything about this. They, they didn't say that people had risen from the grave and wandered around the city, which you'd think everyone would have noticed, and they definitely would have written down, but they didn't, so there was no confirmation of it either. And the fact, if it spread like wildfire, has nothing to do with, with the, whether the events actually occurred or not. Um, you could say today that Scientology spread like wildfire, and at the time, Christianity was a really good idea in comparison to the other religions that were around, like the, the Roman gods and the, the horrible pagan gods and things. It, it may have just been a better idea doesn't make what actually happened true though what they say happened true sorry sorry praise go for it yeah i just think we should wind it down go into our final statements if that's okay gavin yeah yeah that's fine that's all good that's a good so should i go first 
you usually Hello. do. I'm not sure how praise wants to. <laughs> All right, yeah, the, 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 that concludes the debate. Very cordial, cordial, you guys enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for both of you. Good job, both of you. We'll let the audience decide, you know, what who won or whatever. And that's, maybe it's not always about winning either. It's just about exchanging ideas and views. So go ahead, Gavin, and uh, go ahead and finish with your final statement. Then we'll hand it off to Mark Reed. Yeah, sure, sure. So I want to. I really want to thank Mark for um, agreeing to the to the debate. It's not easy. Um, and thanks to Praise for moderating. Moderating is not the easiest job either. Um, the, there is a fact of history, and the historical fact is that time is marked um, by the birth of Jesus Christ in BC before Christ and AD after Christ. Now, time is marked for a reason. This is not a capricious or arbitrary reason. Um, more books, more books have been written about Jesus Christ than any other historic, historical figure uh, in history. There have been uh, the establishment of numerous, numerous universities, including Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, Columbia, and Oxford, all because of Christianity. Um, Jesus laid the foundation, the bedrock for human rights and democracy in more than probably, I'd say, up to 100 um, Western countries, 100 countries in Western civilization. Um, a lead, uh, most notably by the USA, uh, whose Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, was all embedded, embedded in the values of Christianity. Um, Jesus placed high value on each person, regardless of their sex or their race, and he led his he led his followers to promote the rights of women as well as abolish slavery. And these great humanitarian organizations owe their existence to Jesus Christ and Christianity. These are the organizations like Red Cross, World Vision, Samaritan's Purse, Mercy Ship, Salvation Army, etc., etc. Um, the resurrection is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Uh, if it did not happen, if it did not happen, Christianity would have petered out and died in the first century. Uh, there were other people who who sort of stood up to the plate and claimed to be the Messiah, uh, but they were beaten back and eventually killed. Christianity exploded. People died for what was the truth of Christianity. People do not die for what they know to be a lie. If somebody knows something is a lie, it's highly unlikely they're going to die for it. But many, many, many people died for the name of Jesus Christ because he came from he came back from the dead. If he can come back from the dead, then we will have eternal life as well. And I'll yield the rest of my time to my learned opponent. Very good, Thanks, Gavin. Gavin. And we'll hand it off to you, Mark Reed, to finish out our conclusion, our concluding remarks, and we'll head into questions and answers. Um, I just want to say thank you to Gavin. Um, that was a really good good close, and thanks for praise for moderating, and uh, thanks for all the mods that are that are in chat and for you for listening in. It's been absolutely fantastic. I've had a blast, so thank you so much for allowing me to do this. Um, so my main questions that I had at the start, and maybe, I mean, I'll leave it up to you whether they were addressed by Gavin or not, but my main questions to Gavin was, what methodology is Gavin using to make sure he has reached the right conclusions? So what systematic process is he making sure that this is correct? Um, I didn't hear so much of a methodology. Um, and, and so I, I think f from my view, that sort of failed, but, um, you know, I I'll leave it up to you to decide. Um, uh, and and how can it be repeated um, by anyone else to reach the same conclusions? And that sort of hasn't been demonstrated either. Um, there's been no real methodology that's been consistent over religions to say, hey, this is how you would reach one religion as opposed to any. Now, I don't disagree that Christians 
um, exist and, and really, really, really believe in what they're saying, I think they're very, very um, um, forthright and very uh, uh, earnest in what they believe. Um, but that doesn't make it true and that isn't good evidence for it to be true. All the people in the world could believe something like the earth is flat and that doesn't make it flat. It's not good evidence that, that people believe it. And, and people on a plane that are going to crash it could really believe that, that the plane that they crash and is going to you know, take them to heaven and have them virgins in heaven. Um, that doesn't make it true. Um, so what the methodology of saying, hey, if, if a large amount of people believe in it and they say they really believe in it and they say they have eyewitnesses, then that's good evidence. I would argue is is absolutely false. That is not good evidence. And we can see that around the world by people believing all kinds of things that are, are not true. Um, you know, it, it used to be that, that again, with the flat earth, uh, it, people were absolutely certain, absolutely certain that if you sailed, it'd go off the edge of the earth. Uh, it's not true. Um, and, and people can believe in all kinds of things for all kinds of reason. What I'm, my position is, is that you need good, solid, demonstrable evidence. And I'm sorry, Gavin, I just haven't seen any today. And that's that's my time. Very good, very good. So we'll head into the Q and A period now. There's there's like four or five of them. And how it works is to the person who the question is addressed to, they can end uh, that question with. So if it's like to you, Mark, if uh, if Gavin answers it, then you can find you can finalize the question with you, or or vice versa. So. The first question is from Crimson Air. I'd like to hear from Mark what atheism has advanced for humanity. Uh, nothing. It's not supposed to. Atheism is simply a stance on a belief position. So um, it, it's the rejection of a claim. So when people claim that there are gods from any religion, not just Christianity, from any religion, sort of so um, um, Hinduism or, or Buddhism or anything, it's a single stance on a position saying, hey, I, I don't believe that that claim. So it isn't supposed to advance anything. Um, we use other things for that. Like, for instance, I'm not, I'm not just an atheist. I'm also a secular humanist. So I believe in the prosperity of humanity and the, the progress of humanity. Um, I'm also a scientist, so I believe in uh, methodological naturalism as the best way to advance progress. Um, but the, atheism by itself doesn't doesn't really advance anything. Gotcha. And Gavin, if you want to quickly respond to that, go ahead, man. If you just want to go to the next question, too, we can... No, 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 I, I will respond to that. Um, atheism destroys, absolutely. All we have to do is look at the godless regimes that ruled in the 20th century and the absolute millions upon millions of dead women and children that resulted from regimes that pushed God aside and replaced God with men. And that is a historical fact. So, Mark, if you want to finish, we'll go ahead. Oh, and yes. So th those regimes, they were built upon sort of nationalistic um, ideas as well. A atheism by itself doesn't do anything. It's simply the rejection of a claim. It's not, it doesn't have any inherent uh, bias towards destruction or bias towards, um, you know, uh, helping people at all. Um, I, I generally help people because of uh, other philosophies that I do believe in, not because of atheism, which is the lack of belief in something. So humanism, for instance, um, does a lot of good throughout the world, including secular humanism. Uh, humanism exists in religion. I'm just believing the secular side of it because I don't believe in, in a god. Um, so if you can find humanist or secular humanist societies that cause destruction sure you may have a point but you know be, uh, saying this thing was atheist by itself it just doesn't get you there i'm sorry gotcha so the next question is from pigs can fly he says 
what constitutes as evidence that God exists? I'm guessing that's directed to, to you, Mark. Yeah, I'd say so. So um, I, I'm not exactly sure, but um, I think that um, when, I, when I talk about evidence and sort of the robustness and rigorousness of it, I think that that, that should be a factor, especially robustness, that, that everybody performing the same experiment would get the same thing. I don't know what would convince me of God. If, if I had evidence that would convince you of God, I'd already believe in it, so I haven't encountered it yet. I'm not saying it can't exist. I'm not saying that evidence can't be demonstrated to me, but, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, so I, I, I suppose I would just have to go back to my intro and say, you know, rigorous, um, a robust um, evidence that, that is evident, that is apparent to, to everybody. Go ahead, Gavin, if you can respond to that. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 well, the most obvious evidence is from general revelation. Um, you know, you look at everything around us. The universe had a start. The cosmos had a start. It wasn't always eternal. And science, science contends that the cosmos or the universe uh, uh, emerged from quantum information. However, that information still needs an antecedent, still needs a mind for it to come from. So I think that is uh, good, good, uh, good, good, solid evidence for the God of the Bible. Gotcha. And Mark, if you want to respond to that, yep. go ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm not even sure the universe had a start. I don't think that's been... Um... I don't think there's any theory that has shown that to be absolutely true. I think that sort of Planck time after the the start, it sort of breaks down. So we can't really see the origin point, which is a problem because um, if, if everything breaks down before that, we can't say possibly whether it had a start or it had existed in some other state. And you said uh, quantum information. I believe that that's referring to um, Dr. Lawrence Krauss's sort of um, universe from nothing, where he says that the universe came from a quantum field. I'm not sure he said information, um, you know, but but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that's good evidence because I don't know how the universe came into existence. You, you're the one that, that's claiming that you know, but unfortunately you can't provide any evidence for it. Gotcha. Very good. And uh, we'll go to Crimson Air. Uh, he says, I wonder if Mark affirms the existence of all facts that independent of a supreme entity. I hope someone can summon Darth Dawkins. <laughs> Ooh, so this is, this is an interesting question. Sort of, so uh, I think he's, he's sort of um, hinting at Hume's problem in induction and where rationality comes from as a base concept. Um, so this, this is really interesting because um, without getting too much in the weeds, that if you're just basically saying that God's the foundation and is outside rationality, how are you getting back to it? Um, it it's a very interesting question. I, I have to presuppose at the base level the the, the laws of, of logic, of, of the law of identity, the law of the excluded middle, and the law of non-contradiction, um, because I have to. I mean, you can't talk about God, or when you reference God without the law of identity, what are you talking about? If, if there's no law of identity to pin down God, then you could be talking about anything or nothing or both without the law of contradiction. You could be talking about God and not God at the same time. So I have to presuppose the laws of logic because it is entirely necessary. Um, if you could do the same demonstration with God, I, I would love it, but I'd love for you to demonstrate God without using the law of identity. Um, and I'll leave that as a challenge to you. Demonstrate God without the law of identity. Good luck. So, Gavin, if you want to respond to Mark, but also the question, if he, I'll give you time if you want to respond to that. Oh, just quickly, quickly. I've said it before. Science is the wrong utility to demonstrate God. That's that's a well-known fact. And let's see uh, from Pete. Okay, I'm not sure. If, maybe I didn't get his first name, but... Okay, why is it that 
is reasonable to assume that there was a resurrection occurred just because the tomb was found empty. I guess that's directed to you, Gavin. Well, his Christ's dead body was not in that tomb on the Sunday morning. Uh, the women that went to the tomb were fully expecting his body to be there. That's why they went there to anoint his body with spices, etc. He wasn't there. Um, the resurrection explains the empty tomb. There's, there was no dead body of Christ in that tomb. And then he appeared to his followers and many other people claimed to see him alive as well. And Mark, if you want to respond, then go ahead. Yeah, so that's, I mean, it, you might say it's evidence of an empty tomb. I don't think it's even really good evidence of an empty tomb because I don't automatically think the Bible is very, very credible. But um, you might say, hey, it is evidence of an empty tomb, but not of a resurrection. Um, you have to sort of make a, a leap there to say, hey, an empty tomb equals resurrection, um, even if there are people claiming it to be true. Um, I'm, I'm not taking the position that the body could have been moved or something else could have happened. Um, it doesn't actually get you to a resurrection, and you're absolutely right to ask that question. Well, that concludes it, you guys. And um, before um, we... Does Gavin want to respond to that? Because the question was addressed to him. Oh, that's right, yeah. We can, we can finish with you, Gavin, if you want to respond to that. Yeah. Uh, if Christ had if Christ had not resurrected, it would have been very easy for his enemies to produce his dead body. Gotcha. So that will now conclude it. Good debate, guys. I hope people found it. Um, you know, some type of inform if it's informative. I hopefully it was informative to people, and hopefully that uh, we can have more of these. You know, I like to do these type of debates on this channel. So just email me at praise Jesus the Christ if any atheists out there want to get involved with debates because I know Gavin is itching to debate atheists, and these these like I mean I would too after this debate. So hopefully you know we'll get some more debates on this channel. I will have an after show, and people could come in and weigh in if they want to talk about the debate um i'm not sure if there's any atheists having any after shows but uh if you want to put in the in the chat i'll i'll post it on here and people can head over there great how long have we been going um right under two hours it's gone fast <laughs> <laughs> wow that's fast eh? <laughs> yeah it's been, been fantastic thank you so much for uh, having me on i really really had a blast it was fantastic yeah thanks mark yeah, thanks, thanks mark great, thanks, great, great, great debate yeah great debate. fantastic yeah and hopefully we can have more so mark if you want to debate gavin or even me i i'll be welcome to debate you that'd be fun so sure. it's something to think about and um i know church of entropy is a newer person on this channel so if, if you want to get on here churches at entropy too we can get you in here good to see you i know i've i remember you for a modern day debate i actually moderated <laughs> one of those debates there so i remember her there yeah Jen's so great. yeah all right guys if there's any final words before we shut her off and then uh we're gonna call it a night no, um, just, uh, yeah, take care, everybody, and um, hope you're well. Um, hope this has been entertaining, and um, do like and subscribe to Praise if you do want to see more debates. Much appreciated, much appreciated. All right, guys, uh, well, we're out. We're going to call it a night. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you later. God bless all. God bless. Well, we are offline. Great to Good be. job. Rough.